Nā koutou katoa, ko Engarani me Piripini te whakapaparanga mai, ko Lester me Bristol te whenua tupu, ko Tamaki Makoro te kainga, he Industry Research Liaison Manager o i Safety Science and Research Centre, ko Kaila Atra, toku ingawa. Tēnā koutou katoa. On behalf of the New Zealand Food Safety Science and Research Centre, I'd like to welcome you all to the April edition of the Food Science Seminar Spotlight of 2023, which today is on two recently completed projects from the Cawthorn Institute. Uh, so we've got uh, Dr. Matt Miller, who will be providing us with an update on the web tool Food Safe Test, Food Safe Test Kits for Industry, which is hosted on the, um, the centre website underneath Tool, and was recently expanded to include two new microorganisms and also an updated database. Matt is a research scientist who plays a pivotal role in marine lipid and bioactives research. And then following on from Matt, we have um, Dr. Tim Harwood providing an overview of recent project developed and delivered in partnership with the Tauranga Moana Iwi Customary Fisheries Trust, Manaki Te Awanui and Te Arawa Kite, Kitai Charitable Trust. Tim is an analytical chemist with research interests in natural toxin accumulation gathered from in food gathered from the land and the sea. He co-leads the MB-funded safety uh, seafood safety research platform, is the manager of Cawthron's Food and Bioactives Group, and you may also recognise him as the Deputy Director of the New Zealand Food, Science, food Safety Science and Research Centre. So I'll hand it over to, to you two now to, to get us started. Thank you. Kia ora, everyone. Uh, call Matt Miller, I hope. Uh, hopefully everything's looking good. Okay. Uh, today I want to talk about a bit of work I've been doing for about three years now in different guises. Uh, it's uh, the Food Safe web, uh, website that is looking at test kits for the industry. So in the last two years, our knowledge about test kits have grown. We've all done some nasal sculpting and uh, played around with test kits. I think everyone in New Zealand is probably now pretty familiar with um, these sort of things. Um, but we wanted to really develop a tool now that the food industry can use to assess different test kits. So the original idea came from a lot of salesmen were um, leading the conversation around test kits and there was a lot of information out there. And it was quite hard for especially small to medium enterprises to really delve through and find out what test kits were good for them or what do they need. There's lots of technical jargon, uh, small to it. Uh, medium enterprises didn't really have the capability or the equipment needed and what we wanted to do was sort of demystify a little bit of that or, and provide a space where you could compare and make good decisions. So um, for this new work where we're trying to expand the database, um, there was two lead players, Fonterra and Zespris have really come to the forefront and they've really helped this along. Um, providing not only cash, but some guidance around what um, pathogens or uh, uh, targets that we are looking for. So the original bit of work was looking, we were looking at Listeria and we developed the, the, um, the sort of the beta framework of the um, website. Uh, and then when the center's new website came online, it was transferred across to there and now it lives happily in that space. So what we wanted to do was really enable the food industry to look and compare kits um, that are available in New Zealand. There is also a whole lot of test kits available worldwide, and that's a pretty big uh, ask to try and do that. But we try to look at local distributors and suppliers and compare them um, across New Zealand. Um, and there's a wide range of different food safety concerns. Uh, we originally looked at this guy, Listeria, as a starting point um, to proof of concept if the, the website would work. And then we um, added two more targets, uh, E. coli and coliforms, in, in this upgrade that we're, I'm presenting today. And we also, um, the, the major source of all the data that is on the website comes from the suppliers themselves. They're the ones that have the data sheets and the information about the test kits, but we wanted to make sure it was independently reviewed for accuracy. So um, through the process, we, we, we developed the process for that. And the final thing we wanted to ensure was that the information on the test, test kits were up to date. 
it's a pretty dynamic area, things move in and things out. We didn't know how dynamic that area was, so how often we should update the website. So we've spent the last two years reaching out to the suppliers, seeing how much change was going on in their um, stockpile or their, the, the kits that they provide and reviewed it all for accuracy as we went along. So this is the heart of what we've done. This sits in the Food Safety Centre website. This is the web page, and hopefully this is live, so this will all work for you. And this is the website that myself and a, a developer have developed. Um, so in here, um, we can look at a whole different things. We'll scroll down, and we've got a little choice. So here's the list of pathogens that we're currently available on the website. So we've got a couple of different listeria, um, a few different E. coli and coliforms. So let's just pick E. coli for want of another. Yeah. We can look at the different distributors that we have. And at the moment we have these distributors that are providing data in New Zealand. And then you can tick some boxes uh, depending on um, what you need. So. This was developed for small and medium enterprises and they say, hey, we want to do something in-house um, and we want to look at the environment and each one of these have some information. So if I click on that, that has some information about what ease of this definition is. So we want something that's really easy to use because we don't have much equipment um, and we don't have much of a lab really. So we want to make it easy and we want to have pretty low level of training. So what? how many kits are available in New Zealand is there? And if we roll down this way, um, we see that there's nine kits available here. If you click on one, um, you can see a whole lot of information about that. So you can get the ease of use, some of the information that's already there. But we've also added some of these broad questions you could ask the salesman that you're talking to or maybe some more technical questions that we sort of stockpiled in there so it can start a conversation with them about what use is their kits to them um, and these questions were developed by our microbiological team here they might not fit every single kit but we try to design it to the level of kit that they are and then there's a whole lot of different information about there so there is Protection limits and what you've got to do to dispose of them, what establishment costs. But I think the real power here comes, if I can go back, when we compare a few things. So if we want to compare the tempo one to maybe, let's have a look here, um, the micro snap and another one, let's go with the Solaris one here. Solaris. Compare those three, and then you can go up here and compare the kits. You can get side by side comparison of these kits, where you can get the information on the website and instructions, um, some different ideas around turnaround time, six to eight hours to over a day, um, what sort of validations they have, um, and then when you move down different distributors and you move down here, and this is where you might make some decisions around establishment costs. Well, this one, you need to buy a 25 grand worth of kit to really do it, but that 25 grand worth of kit might do four or five different kits. Um, it's not just for one, but there's, there's different costs involved here. And all this data was provided by the distributors. Again, you might wanna go, hey, what sort of disposable um, thing. So this can be disposed in rubbish, but other ones might need an autoclave or some biohazard rubbish there. So these are some of the decisions that you can make when you're going, which kit is right for me? Some questions to lead into with the suppliers and hopefully just powers up any person that's actually making those decisions about um, what kit they need. So the outcome of this uh, couple of years, a bit of work, is we have developed this website. The website is here. It's off the center. Um, feel free to look at it, click it through. Um, and if there is any data inaccuracies or anything like that, please let me know. Um, we have got this database now has grown into a number of 61 kits um, over different, some kits might have different multiple pathogens. But as you can see, the breakdown here, it's across all those different um, 
species and also they'll be linked into easy or hard, easy, medium or hard sort of levels of use or skills that you need to do it. And all the data that we've got has been validated by a microbiologist here at Cawthron who runs the microbiological testing. So we didn't want to rely solely on the word of the, the suppliers of how good their kit is and what it does and how easy it is. Lots of kit suppliers say, oh, it's all very easy, but then you sort of, sort of need a PhD to run it. Um, we didn't really define that as easy. We, our idea of easy was anyone could pick it up, put the, um, the swab up your nose and put it in like any, like the SARS kits that we're all familiar with. What we learned out of that, oh, so, and then we, we work with these suppliers. So we've engaged a number of suppliers throughout New Zealand. There may be more out there. Um, Suppliers wouldn't tell me who the competition were. I'm keen to find any other ones that we've missed. Um, but through this process, we have found these six. Uh, please let me know if I'm missing anyone off. The ones that we're not have definitely not going to be a focus on are the ones that are internationally made and distributed internationally. Um, that just creates too much trouble. There is thousands, thousands of thousands of kits out there from China, from um, Europe, from America. Um, we're looking at local distribution only. Um, the key message and learnings that we have from this um, work that um, that the database, we were looking at six monthly updates. Um, the, the number of kits don't turn over that much. There's not a huge amount of kits coming online and this could be done annually. We do want to keep this website up to date with the most current data but it doesn't really need to be done every six months i think an annual update would be um uh, will suffice keeping the data relevant um the vendors themselves found the um website very useful and a couple of them use it in their sales pitch they take the um small to medium enterprise um to the website and say here's our kit compare it to others look at x y and z that's why we think ours is good um, and that's great that they're using it. One of the key metrics that is important to industry is the price. Um, and the vendors were very sensitive about giving us the price of their um, uh, uh, kits. And that's possibly because they do deals with different industries. They, they always said, please come to us with a price. So they weren't willing to put a price up there, which I think is a bit is lacking on the website because that's probably one of the key metrics especially any accountants out there is looking for how much is this going to cost us but maybe that's a leading question that you need to go with them um and the feedback from the vendors is there are a lot more different pathogens and possible other contaminants like allergens or um, chemical um contaminants that these kits work with so there is a lot of room to expand this website but we've got to draw some fences around it somewhere so um the next steps for me is actually getting this website to you so this is a part of it it's publicizing it showing people the uh, location and um talking about it so as much as we can we want to get it out there but if anyone has some good ideas how where we could publicize the website to get more people using it i'm all ears um there is some really obvious targets that we could look at salmonella uh, campylobacter chronobacter there's a, these are the ones um industry and um the, the vendors have suggested but there's no reason why we couldn't get allergens or chemical contaminants if they have a kit on this site as well um there is a lot of flexibility around the design that we can add things quite easily and i can update or put new kits in and they can go live immediately um, it would be good to establish a mechanism for future updates, whether it's just updating the data or putting new data, um, new kits in, and that hasn't been really confirmed yet, but we're, we're trying to work through that. And I really believe the centre is the place where we can, um, has a role in this space around identifying the appropriate use of kits for industry, and I, I'm really supportive of the um, centre's support in doing this. I think it's been a 
fantastic and hopefully more industry can use it. So that's it from me. I think we're doing questions at the end. So I might swing away from the microphone and let Tim take over. Okay, uh, kia ora, good afternoon everybody. Um, thanks very much Matt for that presentation, awesome. Um, so today I'm going to speak about um, you know, monitoring for uh, a shellfish poisoning syndrome known as, as PSP uh, in an area of New Zealand known as Bay of Plenty for those international guests on the call. Um, this is an area that occasionally has um, algal blooms which cause PSP and we occasionally get illnesses in this area. And the other key aspect of my presentation today is looking at the potential use of rapid testing kits to help manage this risk in this area of New Zealand. Really want to do a big shout out to my uh, my colleagues here at Cawthron who have helped out with this project, um, Sam Murray, Kirsty Smith, and Tariri Kohu, who's really helped with the um, Maori liaison role uh, up in the Bay of Plenty. So um, Matt's just talked at, at some length about the Food Safe website, and this is largely focused on kits for microbiological targets to date. So this includes pathogens and various other indicator bacteria. But as Matt mentioned, there's a, a range of other food safety targets, such as uh, natural toxins and allergens that can be detected using uh, commercially available testing kits. Uh, so in the in the marine toxin space, there are a number of commercial um, options that are available for the regulated classes of marine toxins, and so these have these three letter acronyms, um, you know, known as uh, DSP, ASP, and PSP. I won't go into into any detail around uh, DSP and ASP, but I think it's worth pointing out that we in New Zealand we do have blooms of algae that do produce all of these regulated toxin classes. And uh, PSP is regarded as the one that poses the greatest risk to our commercial production of shellfish in New Zealand, but also to non-commercial harvest of, of shellfish as well. And so that little table at the bottom of this, this slide shows all the different um, companies that do provide uh, test kits for these different toxin classes. And the, the types of technology that is used are these lateral flow immunoassay devices. So these are the, the COVID type you know, tests that everybody's familiar with over the last couple of years. And these other ELISA kits, en enzyme linked immunosorbent assay, which requires a bit more, um, a bit more uh, laboratory um, equipment to be able to perform the analysis. So this table is a little bit outdated. It was done by Kath McLeod back in 2015, but it just is, is it's included in here to give you a sense that there's you know, a number of commercial operators who do provide kits in this space. So today's talk's about PSP. Um, so this is paralytic shellfish poisoning. This is a, a pretty well-known shellfish poisoning syndrome with well-described symptoms. So in minor cases, you might have tingling of your lips and fingers uh, through to more severe cases where you, you'd experience uh, respiratory distress and in very extreme cases can, can lead to death. Uh, it occurs in uh, many locations around the globe, in, including certain parts of New Zealand. Um, and it's caused by consumption of uh, shellfish uh, that contain a class of compounds known as saxitoxins. You may otherwise hear them referred to as paralytic shellfish toxins. So this suite of toxins, which includes you know, more than two dozen uh, analogues of sex toxin, are produced by certain species of uh, microscopic algae known as, as microalgae. And these toxins accumulating in filter feeding shellfish, uh, things like um, mussels, oysters and scallops um, are the traditional vectors for um, these shellfish toxins. So the monitoring of PSP in New Zealand has traditionally been undertaken uh, prior to 2010 using what's known as the PSP mouse bioassay, and this is still used in some parts of the world. Uh, 
uh, from our perspective, um, it's not able to be used from both an ethical and technical perspective. And so over the last you know, two decades, Cawthron's put a lot of effort uh, into developing chemical and other school methods as alternatives to monitoring uh, shellfish toxins, regulated shellfish toxins. And so we largely base this on uh, liquid chromatography mass spectrometry. And the methods that we have developed are regarded as the approved methods in New Zealand. So we're able to certify uh, export clearance of our shellfish produced commercially in New Zealand. But we also think that rapid kits have you know, great potential uh, for certain time critical applications. And this could be both for industry and at risk communities. And that's the space we're trying to explore at the moment. So just diving into a little bit more um, around uh, test kits for paralytic shellfish toxins. Um, again, the table comes from CAT's report uh, a few years ago now, um, but there are a number of commercial options that are available for paralytic shellfish toxins. Uh, and each of the different commercial kits has its own benefits and drawbacks. And I've just given some examples of some of the considerations that you might want to take into account. So these are things like cost, the amount of time it takes to do the test, you know, what sort of equipment is needed and validation status of the, of the different kit. And these are things that Matt highlighted in his presentation before. So of all these kits, we, we had pretty good experience with the, this one known as the Neogen Reveal 2.0 test strips. And we, uh, our reason for, for knowing quite a lot about this is through an uh, Australian-led research project which um, assessed four different kits for, for PSP. Um, and so this, this research project, the outcome of it was determined that the Neogen kit was the most suitable. And this was based on you know, a couple of parameters with sensitivity, ease of use, and performance being the, the key criteria. So one of the things that, that happened was um, something called an SLV, a single laboratory validation was undertaken uh, using a, a species of mussels known as blue mussels and oysters. And publication from that validation is shown in the bottom left there. And essentially what that showed is that the, the probability of determination at the regulatory limit for this class of toxin was really good. You can have great confidence in the, in the test strips, you know, being able to detect the toxins when they're present at um, a concerning level within, within shellfish. So following on from the single lab validation, um, a much broader uh, inter-laboratory validation with um, labs um, across the world was conducted. And this followed what they know is known as the AOC guidelines for, for qualitative binary methods. And this, um, this showed good performance of the, of the kit as well. And the, the outcome of, of that work was published in the publication shown there on the bottom right. So in a New Zealand context, um, the, the performance of this Neogen kit has also been assessed with species that are important um, uh, for, for us here in New Zealand. So this is the, the green shell mussel, um, the, the, the black lip uh, abalone, the, which is the Heliotis iris, and, um, and our, our lobster species as well. So if we zero in on the, the Bay of Plenty, this is um, historically a hotspot for, for PSP. There have been um, a number of blooms of the microalgae species that are known to produce these toxins. Um, this is a the figure here is uh, from an article that Lincoln McKenzie produced some time ago, but there have been a number of blooms over a number of years of Alexandrium within the Bay of Plenty. It genuinely is a hotspot. Uh, so Alexandria Pacificum uh, largely is the species responsible, but Alexandria Minutum also does bloom within the bay. And these um, microalgae bloom when conditions are favourable. And understanding what these conditions are is a large part of the research that we conduct here at Court on understanding the ecology of these microalgae bloom species, you know, what's driving them to bloom so that we can have a better um, indication of what's going to happen, what's likely to happen in the future. One thing we do know is that the, the resting cysts 
um, are present in marine sediments within the Bay of Plenty, which, which makes it likely that they're going to be bloom, bloom events in the future when uh, conditions are optimal for them to germinate and then bloom. So there is uh, some monitoring that goes on in the in the Bay of Plenty and indeed elsewhere around the, the coastline, uh, uh, coastal areas around New Zealand. So that all of this is administered through uh, MPI, the Ministry of Primary Industry. And largely within the Bay of Plenty, this comes uh, under what's known as the Non-Commercial Marine Toxin Monitoring Program. And this is made up of a combination of taking water samples and looking down the microscope as to what harmful and bloom species are present. And then if they are present, uh, enumerating, counting how many are there. And then uh, also this, uh, there's, there's some shellfish testing for the presence of marine toxins themselves. So it's a, a combination of water samples and shellfish testing. And so the graphic there uh, shows the Bay of Plenty in the different sampling sites. The white uh, boxes are weekly phytoplankton sites, and the green sites are, are fortnightly shellfish um, sampling sites. And so the, the shellfish that are, are sampled is a, a type of surf clam known as uh, tuatua, except for a hopi, which is a, a mussel sample. So all of these samples um, make their way to Cawthron. It takes about a day for them to arrive here, and it takes us a day to analyze and report the sample. So you're looking at 40 hour, 48 hour turnaround time once you've accounted for sampling, shipping, testing, and reporting. And so based on the results that are generated, MPI would issue a shellfish biotoxin alert uh, and erect signage um, should the test results warrant it. And so this is kind of what it looks like. Oh, this is what it looks like. So on the right there, you've got a, a screen clipping from the Ministry of Primary Industries website showing a health warning for uh, shellfish on the west coast of the North Island. This was taken from late last year. Um, but it doesn't contain any information about the levels that were observed, just that there is a, a public health warning that is in place. And on the left there is an example of a, a signage that gets erected in areas where um, um, a public health warning has been notified. Um, so this that picture was actually one I took over over Christmas of last year when I was I was holidaying and um, was thinking about gathering some shellfish and decided not to. Okay, so um, so we've covered off um, uh, you know what what's going on in the bar plenty. Harmful blooms occur there occasionally. There is some monitoring going on. But there are still some communities where the risk is posed, and I'll just explain this now. Where um, you know, gathering of seafood or kai moana is is central to a lot of cultural practices, especially for, for Maori, and <clears throat> there's often elevated consumption during uh, big events, things like uh, hui and, and tangihanga, and so. When this happens, the shellfish is gathered and consumed quickly, often within the day. And so rapid decision making is required uh, as to whether the, the kaimawana that has been harvest, harvested is, is safe to eat. Uh, and so the existing uh, monitoring uh, and release of information is too slow to account for this type of activity. Um, and that the flow of information is not optimal in, in our eyes. So this, this is where the question comes in, how can rapid kits be used in this type of situation to reduce the risk of, um, of uh, food, food poisoning, shellfish poisoning? So to address this, um, we worked in with um, the Te Arawa Kitai um, Trust, and in particular, uh, Auntie Raywin Bennett, who helped um, us coordinate a, a wānanga up in Makatu in August of last year. <coughs> Excuse me. So this was a, a three-day event and, and was a you know, really great opportunity to share, share knowledge um, where we could talk about uh, what we knew about harmful algal blooms event within the bay, 
around the testing for marine toxins, how that's done in a laboratory, but how it can also be done in the field. And then we we heard some awesome information as well around the exper experience of that community with PSP, um, how they uh, collect shellfish and consume uh, shellfish from a, a customary point of view, um, and what their knowledge was around the monitoring that uh, that has been going on um, within the bay for for a period of time, you know, whether they know that information has been generated, uh, and if and when they they see signage that is erected um, by MPI. The part of this Wananga was a, a really uh, in depth training opportunity, you know, using the, the Neogen kit. So this was, uh, you know, hands on where we went out into the into the local bay and collected shellfish that morning. Uh, we cleaned it, prepped it, prepared it with um, the, those who were part of the training, and then you know did the analysis um, and showed them how the, how the kits worked. We also bought um, positive control material. Was, there were no blooms at the time, so we could you know, really clearly show what a positive result was and a, and a negative result was. Um, so part of the benefit of this type of test kit is um, you insert the, the test strip into a reader, and so that takes out the um, subjectivity of uh, a person looking at the test strip as to whether or not it's positive. Um, so this, this was a, a really, really cool experience. And um, we were fortunate enough to uh, be able to leave behind uh, a lot of the uh, uh, equipment that's required to be able to perform this test. So, and, and leaving behind a, a number of um, boxes of test strips, um, which allowed um, the ability to continue testing on into the, the foreseeable future. Um, so as part of this training also, um, we, we generated some sort of flip charts, so easy to follow guides as how to, to do this testing. Um, there was some information provided within the kits themselves, um, whereas we thought we could break it down uh, with some visual guides uh, to, to make it simpler. Because um, it's, yeah, it, it, it can be tricky to do, um, and you want to make sure you get it right. Okay, so just in summary, um, we believe uh, rapid kits for marine toxins have a good potential in certain applications. Uh, with the one we've talked about, or I've talked about today, is supporting at risk communities to make near real time decisions about the safety of their, the seafood that they gather. Uh, but we need a, a better understanding of how they can be used uh, effectively and enduringly to reduce risk. And we fully acknowledge that a one-off training session in Maka 2 um, is not sufficient. So there needs to be uh, an ongoing um, resourcing to be able to provide training and the science, underpinning science to, to make this happen. So we, we have proposed some next steps in this space. Um, we're, we're looking to host a hui with um, iwi and haku uh, from around the Bay of Plenty and further to the north uh, with some uh, even happy groups from Northland uh, to discuss their food safety issues and needs. And then part of this conversation will be considering some pilot studies with these groups in areas where PSP is problematic and the types of things we'd like to talk about um, and co-develop is around training and ongoing support. Uh, what the actual science needs are. So one of the you know, key things is that we actually haven't validated the kit for Pippi or Tua Tua yet. And we have confidence that they that they do that it will work, but we need to show that uh, empirically. But then we need to think about, you know, once a result is generated, how would that information be shared and managed? Um, you know, a key part to the conversation is, is working closely with, uh, with MPI. Um, as the regulator for uh, food safety in New Zealand. So just um, that, that's all I've got to say about um, our experience in the Bay of Plenty. It's been a, a really awesome opportunity for me to be involved with um, produce Māori groups up there. Um, I've learned a lot and I look forward to it continuing over the, the next few uh, weeks, years and um, yeah, long night.
continue. So just uh, just to finish off, big thank you. Um, got my and Matt's uh, emails there. If you'd like have any questions around the food safe website, feel free to get in touch um, with Matt. Uh, questions about uh, PSP kits or marine toxins in general, please feel free to reach out to me and we'll get back in touch with you as soon as we can. Thanks very much for your time. Great. Thanks, Tim. Thanks, Matt. That's um, yeah, really interesting to to hear the work that you've been you've been doing with the centre. Um, I've got a couple of questions so far for Matt, but um, yeah, if you've got anything that's um on your mind, then please pop it into the the Q and A. So, for Matt, the first question I've got is: Is there any information on the validation in each matrix? Yes, each um. Each kit supplier has supplied a, a validation level of their um, kits, and they are honest on them is to share that validation with that. So that will, that is supplied in the website. On each matrix, maybe difficult. There's a series of matrices that are listed in the website, and hopefully the matrix you want is in there. So it's a part of the data set. Okay, great. Thank you. Hope that helps. Um, and I've also had a um, question from Jamie Bridson, who is based at Scion, and says, thanks, Matt, for your presentation. Have you had any experience with chemical contaminant, uh, chemical contaminant test kits, e.g. phthalates or uh, bisphenol A? If so, can you please feedback on your experience with such, such kits, uh, sensitivity, specificity, ease of use, et cetera? No, no, I haven't. Um, I haven't looked at any chemical testing kits. Um, it would be good to include them, but, uh, but no experience so far. Yeah, I think it, kind of it's worth mentioning there is, you know, our initial work with the, the Food Safe website was, was driven by uh, industry needs. So we reached out and tried to understand what their priority targets were. And so that's where this area and these subsequent ones have come from. Mm -hmm. If we've got some industry parties who identify those chemical contaminants as, as a need for them, then we'd like to know and then we can do some work in that space. Yeah and that kind of leads me to my next thing so um, Matt you mentioned about the Salmonella Coronabacillin Campy as potential next target so are there, I assume there are commercially available kits for these, this is just me, <laughs> my ignorance asking. Yeah there are um, the kits but that the vendors said that they probably sell the most of. Okay. So that's probably where that's coming from. Yeah. So my question to our industry members who are still with us, um, would these be of any use to you to then potentially look at those, evaluating those as part of the um, the kit's website? And if so, please get in touch with me and we can see what we can um, we can do about that. Um, I've not got any more questions coming yet. So um, just moving on to Tim. So how was how did you find the actual um, training session that you that you held down in, in the Bay of Plenty. Like how long how long did it go on for? Um what was um what was the reception like? Yeah, yeah, we weren't quite sure how it was going to go. Um sort of prepared this material in advance, so positive control material and flip charts and those things. Uh but it, it worked out really well, uh, really, really hands-on. And um, you know, by the end of the sessions, uh, people could could run the kit independently. Um, so there's a little bit of sample prep that's required around, you know, weighing out a certain amount of shellfish and then rolling it between some membranes, which is, you know, take, takes a little bit of you know, understanding of how to do it properly. And, you know, once you've done it once or twice, um, you know, you're, you're in a good place to be able to have confidence in the results that you, that you generate. Um, but I know um, from... The, the Australian example where they've tried to roll these kits out for industry that, um, you know, one-off training session is not sufficient. There needs to be sort of ongoing, you know, regular updates if you want to have real confidence in, in how they're going and in, in the results that you generate. And the kits themselves don't contain a positive control material. So if you get a negative result, you might have just done the kit wrong. And this, know, is, yeah. Yeah, this is the same with, uh, you know, COVID testing at time. If you don't put the swab up your nose correctly, uh, you may not actually pick up the, the virus. So, um, 
yeah, that's something we need to think about going forward is how do we ensure that the data that or the results that are being generated um, are accurate and fit for purpose. So while, while you're on the hot seat here, Tim, you said there was a reader involved. I've got my sort of website yeah. hat on. Yeah. How how much is one of those readers? And you know, I mean, how could it could be could it be set up in Marais and that sort of thing? Yeah. Yeah, so it's the read is about five thousand dollars. So there is a, a capital cost for that. But as with the example you gave in your test kit, Matt, it, it does have the ability to test for other targets. So this vendor does have kits for other food safety targets, which they you know you may have interest in. And we as part of the work we're proposing, um, is that um the support is not just for um, the scientists to do their part. This is about supporting iwi and hapu, and that there'd be resource available for them to purchase a reader to put in a central site that could be used by the community um, that, that's surrounding that area. So um, we're, we're still trying to work it out, but there is a cost associated with having that reader. Yeah, no, that's, yeah, that's really interesting. And it's, um... I, yeah, I've been part of projects previously trying to get you know, science and, and STEM engagement in there. And that's probably quite a nice way of, of mm -hmm. getting the, the rangatahi from the area in and seeing some science actually in action of, you know, I take this from the sea, mm -hmm. um, you know, do some fancy things with it, rolling it around on the membranes and then put it in a fancy machine and then out comes your answer. And yes, it's safe to eat, go off, go off and eat, go off and eat your seafood. So yeah, a nice way of, of, of engaging the, the the youth in the area of STEM. Yeah, so, I mean, one of the things they're really interested in is, uh, yeah, the, the information that's been generated uh, almost on a weekly basis by the MPI monitoring program, and you know, and how the information that's being generated there can be fed through to those communities so that they can understand what's going on in their environment. At the moment, it's a bit disjointed that information flow and. Yeah, if, if we can improve that some somehow, we'd, we'd look to do that as well. But that, that's a conversation with um, all of the parties that we need to have. Yeah, that's great. Now, I've not had any more questions come in, so I think we'll we'll wrap up for now and give everybody back 15 minutes of their day. Everybody always likes a bit more time back. Um, so thank you very much for your time and expertise, Matt and Tim. Um, this has been recorded and will be made available on our website soon. Um, all our previous talks from earlier this year are already there. Um, just another reminder about our annual symposium meeting, which is on uh, the 3rd of July in Dunedin. It's also um, NZIFST conference. Um, so we look forward to seeing you there. So in the meantime, thank you for your attendance. Have a good rest of your day and week, and we will see you next time. Um, our next one is on the, I think, the 30th of May and the, um, the invites will be coming out soon. So thank you. Bye.